welcome everybody, welcome everybody who uh, is here this uh, Sunday after Christmas. Um, we are glad to see you guys and actually really excited about January and all the exciting things that are coming. So in two weeks, we have a prospective church planter coming to preach here. Um, and we will be having a get together maybe that Friday or Saturday night at our house. So be on the lookout for like text message or something from us once we kind of talk to people and confirm what works best. But um, just really be praying that first, you know, that that uh, we could, you know, have some some clarity and some discernment as to whether or not he would be a great fit for us. And also for, you know, peace and clarity in the decision for him and his wife. They're both coming out here pregnant with their fifth child, um, and and they're they're coming out here alone so that they can pray and really kind of see the community and just feel if God is calling them here or not. It's it's really exciting and we are hopeful and um, would love to have them here, but of course we want God's will to be done, so just really pray both for us and for them and that God would discern that. And his name is Remington, goes by Rem Diaz. So just be praying for that. Um, we're also going to be starting a new curriculum at Children's Church soon. Um, and I thought there was one other announcement that I'm forgetting, but maybe I'll think of it later. Um, we gather in this new church plan over our mission statement, which reads, By grace, we are rooted in the gospel, committed to growing together, and sent to love Lakin and the nations. If you'll stand and join us in the call to worship today, it's from Psalm 148. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights above. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his heavenly hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the skies. Let them praise the name of the Lord. For his name alone is exalted. His splendor is above the earth and the heavens. Yes, remain standing as we worship through song.
Here now, the assurance of pardon. This isn't just a, a sort of 
statement that I'm making. This is really a declaration that comes from God to you to be placed on your heart. We just confessed our sin before an almighty God. That should terrify us. And yet God has given us an assurance, a declaration of pardon. His word says, Surely He, Jesus, has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed Him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But He was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon Him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Amen. Sat down and spoke to the woman who had come 
together. The one who had heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized, her and her household as well, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed among us. The word of the Lord. You may be seated. Good morning. Most of you know me. I'm Tyler Trailer. I hail from Denver. Uh, that's my wife, Ashlyn. Hopefully you've met her this morning or, or in the past. Uh, we were just in Austin, Texas for Christmas with her family, which was a lot of fun. Hope you guys had a good Christmas. Uh, I know that Titus and Erica, you guys were up the lake, and hope that some of you guys were able to at least get out and be with family or do something fun this Christmas. Uh, we're coming out of this Advent season, this Christmas world, and now we're getting ready to go into 2021. This is our last Sunday of 2020. So we're getting ready to leave this year behind us. I hope that kind of can feel good for you a little bit. I know this year's been a crazy, crazy year. And a lot of us are looking forward to freedom from COVID restrictions coming in 2021, freedom from some of the craziness of this last year. But what I think is interesting, and I want to kind of call this out this morning, we all have this tendency to want to have freedom from something. It's sort of a, a negative freedom is what we call it in the, the big philosophical sphere. Freedom from things is a negative freedom, which is really the American way. It's really kind of built into our bones. We see these, these obstacles to freedom, and we want to be free from anything holding us down. We want to be free individuals. We love our freedom. And I don't know, this is kind of shifting a little. I don't know if you guys use Spotify at all. Uh, every, 20, every year, at the end of the year, Spotify gives you kind of some statistics on the music you listen to through the year. It's called Spotify Wrapped. And it tells you your top genres and favorite albums, favorite songs. And this year, my, some of my favorites were The Beatles. And that's normally not at the top of my list, but I think this year I was really kind of longing for that sense of freedom, that sense of joy, that sense of playfulness. It's like, I want to be free from some of my restrictions, so I'm going to some of the fun Beatles songs that may give me that sense of joy and peace, whatever it would be. Uh, and I came across this song this year by George Harrison. Uh, it's called Any Road. You may have heard it. It was on his last album in 2000-something. Uh, one of the main lines that goes through it and if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. So George is saying, if you don't know where you're going, then any road will take you there. And I think he's actually really hitting on this American spirit that we have, this sort of freedom spirit. If I don't have any aim, then I can take any road that I want. If I don't have anything that I'm going towards, then I can take any road, and it will get me there. There's another American, sometime in the 1950s, Jack Kerouac, you may have heard him. He's kind of a precursor to the hippie movement. Uh, he wrote a book titled On the Road, and in it there's this big saying, the road is life. The road itself, the journey itself, is what we live for. We live to be able to take any road we want, whatever we want to take it. We live for that freedom, that spirit of adventure. We love the hero who's the pioneer, who goes and takes on whatever journey he wants, who essentially is the master of his own destiny. We love that narrative. And so when we think about 2021, it's kind of built into us to think, I can't wait to be free from the restrictions that were on me this year. I can't wait to have freedom from whatever was inhibiting me in the year before. We love this spirit, this, this George Harrison and Jack Kerouac spirit that says, I get to be the master of my own destiny. I don't necessarily need a goal. I want to take any road to get me there. And see, I actually think that the hippies are kind of onto something on this one. They say, if you're not aimed at anything, if you don't know where you're going, then there really is nothing stopping you from taking any road that you want. If there is no end goal, you can live in whatever 
way you want, and if there is no goal, then actually you become the goal. This is really kind of the impetus behind it all. Life's journey, if there is no goal, is really one long process of trying to find or make yourself. It's all about self-actualization. It's about bringing you and your own goals to fruition. Life's journey is about yourself. If you're not on the road to somewhere, then you become the destination. You living on the road, you on the journey, becomes what it's all about. And while this total freedom may sound attractive, if you don't know where you're going, then we all know that this sense of rootlessness can actually begin to creep into your life. If we're not actually aimed at something, then meaningless really does begin to grab a hold of you. And the next thing you know, this mission for self-actualization actually begins to tarnish the self that you thought you were trying to protect. This mission for self-actualization, because you live a rootless life, actually begins to destroy the self that you wanted. And so you end up feeling the sense of shame, I'm not enough. I never actually can be what I thought I wanted to be. Or maybe you feel this endless fight that you have to live. I have to take on the next hill because that's where I find my meaning. When we live a life of aimlessness, when we're not on a road to somewhere, then we're actually on a road to nowhere. George Harrison is really calling us, he, he thinks he's calling us to a sort of meeting where we get to live a life for ourselves, but it's really a sort of hell where I'm living for myself and I actually am going to end up nowhere because there's nothing actually drawing me out into a fuller and meaningful life. Freedom from things, if, if that's all we're trying to live is, is a life where I can choose any path that I want, I'm free from any restriction, will actually lead us into a deeper and darker place than we originally thought. But I think this is the sort of journey that most of us find ourselves on. Whether it's freedom from my, my spouse, freedom from some of the restrictions that we live in our marriage, or freedom from my work. You know, I'm tired of having this restriction on me. I don't want anything to do. I want to be able to live my life however I want. People are tempted, and myself included, we're all tempted to live a life that is longing for freedom from something. Freedom from restrictions, either to try to find myself or to try to make myself. We can think of a tar like easy targets along the way, like a man who's trying to live his own life. I'm trying to be the rugged individual. Or we can think of the religious folk. We've said this before, where these people are trying to build their own religious character. They're trying to make themselves before God, trying to make themselves righteous, construct their own identity as Christians. They're trying to make their own road of self-actualization. They're not necessarily on a road to anywhere. They themselves are the end goal. And so what they're really trying to do is create themselves and it ultimately leads to a life where you realize, I can't create myself. And it creates rootlessness. And it creates deeper and darker sadness than we thought. This is even the journey that I went on at some point in my life. When I moved from Kansas to Colorado, we moved west you know, we took the pioneer's journey. We moved west to try to create our own self. I was even in the religious crowd to some level where I'm trying to create a more and more righteous Christian. I'm trying to go to this Christian school and learn how to do the right thing and be the right guy. I went to create myself. I went on a journey of self-actualization. I wanted to be free from my old constraints and go west, in a sense, and, and kind of create who I wanted to be. I think most people find themselves on this journey, even committed Christians. I think we're all on this journey of trying to create ourselves. Because really, we're, we really believe this American spirit that if I could be free from this restriction, then I would have the power to be who I want to be. And so, what we're going to think about today and talk about today is this idea of road maps and road blocks. What our text this morning was from the book of Acts, which we know is kind of a missionary journey. It's Paul going on the road. But what we see in this text is actually a couple roadblocks that come up to Paul. But these aren't just roadblocks in general. These are actually roadblocks from God. And so we see 
that God himself is setting up roadblocks in the way of Paul. And then once those roadblocks are met, he actually calls Paul on another map. He calls him to a different destination. And that destination is actually a fruitful missional journey that he calls on. God has a purpose for those roadblocks and roadmaps. But what we see is that Paul doesn't actually bear this sense of shame and guilt when he comes across the road, roadblocks. When the Holy Spirit tells him not to go through to Asia, or when the Holy Spirit tells him not to go through to Bithynia, he doesn't feel, oh, I failed again. I can't do this again. He actually returns to the Spirit in prayer, and eventually the Spirit directs him on where to go next, how to fulfill the mission that he's called him on. And so, why are we doing this? Why, why are we kind of going through all this? Because as we enter into 21, we want to really be thinking about, okay, there may have been some roadblocks in 2020. There may have been some things that have been holding us back. But rather than thinking, how can I be free of that? How can I have freedom from that? I want to really call us in today to ask the question, what am I free towards? Rather than just freedom from the restrictions of 2020, in 2021, what does God free me up to do? He's not just freeing me from things. What is God making me free to do? Making me free towards in 2021. And so I think our text today can really give us some insight into that. I think it can really kind of build us up to actually really give us the strength and the courage to step into the new year with a real sense of calling and a real sense of mission uh, all rooted and founded in the glorious news of Jesus Christ. So we're going to ask a few questions today. Uh, they should be fairly self-explanatory, but they're going to kind of guide us. The first one, what is Paul's roadmap? We all have a roadmap. What is Paul's roadmap? And two, how does this roadmap help him to overcome his obstacles? How does the roadmap help him overcome his obstacles? So before we go any further, Let's pray and open our ears and hearts to see what God has for us this morning. Father God, you are drawing us out of the Christmas season. You're drawing us into a new year. God, we believe that you had a word for us this morning. We believe that, like Paul, you are actually calling us towards things, not just calling us to be free from things, but calling us, freeing us up, to move into things. So God, would you place on our hearts this morning the things that you are freeing us up towards in 2021? Would you place on our hearts a, a real understanding of how it is that the good news of Jesus actually frees us to live out the mission of God? Would you, would you speak that to our hearts this morning? Pray this in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Like I said, uh, we're going to be t asking two questions, both one, what is Paul's roadmap, and how does that roadmap help him overcome his obstacles or the roadblocks that are in his way? So, beginning with that first question, what is the roadmap? We all know that Paul had a conversion story. If you read, you can read about it in Acts 9. It essentially is the story of Paul, who was a sort of self-made religious persecutor of Christians who was trying to essentially earn the righteousness of God on his own strength when he had a moment where Jesus appeared to him and offered him real divine grace and mercy. He offered him his own righteousness. And so we know that story in Acts 9, but Paul actually gives us a little bit more insight in Philippians 3 as to where he's headed, what he's aimed at. We have a general idea that he became a Christian, that he became a follower of Jesus, but what does that actually entail? And so in Philippians 3, we can read about it. He gives us a little more insight. He, he really tells us that ultimately, he's actually not aimed at self-actualization. He's not aimed at trying to make himself. He's actually aimed at dying to himself. I'm going to read a couple of verses from Philippians 3. See if you can pull that theme out. Where is he trying to die to himself in here? Philippians 3, verse 7. 
But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I have counted all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and have counted them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ, and may be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is found in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know Him, the power of His resurrection, and the fellowship of His sufferings, and being conformed to His death, in order that I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained it, not that I have become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that which was all, which also I was laid hold of by Christ. Brothers and sisters, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching towards what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. To summarize just a little bit of that, Paul is telling us that after his conversion, the aims of his old life have faded away. His desire to earn righteousness before God, his desire to make himself, his desire to make his own life the way that he feels it ought to be has faded away. In fact, they become rubbish when they're compared with the glory that is offered him in Christ Jesus. When he compares the identity that he was trying to construct for himself with the identity that he has been given in Christ, there's no comparison. His old identity is rubbish. I know that I have an identity that I'm trying to make for myself. I live into this identity. I'm trying to make this identity. I want to be this person. But this is rubbish compared to the identity that Jesus has given me. And this goes for all of us. Paul's old identity is rubbish compared to what is being given to him now. For Paul, his own identity wasn't self-constructed or self-actualized. Paul didn't make himself. He didn't choose the right road of life and eventually create himself. Rather, it was given to him by God. In fact, this identity which God offered Paul was so great that in verse 10 he begins, that I may know him, Jesus, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, and being conformed to his death, Paul was willing to die to himself. His own ambitions, his own life, his own desires, he was willing to set aside for the sake of setting his sights on Christ, pressing on towards the goal of Christ. He says that I press on towards the goal, for the prize is the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. The goal is not the new job. The goal is not the perfect family. The goal is the upward call in Christ. That is the roadmap that Paul is following. What Paul is saying here is that the righteous identity which Jesus offers really only makes sense when we die. When we set aside our own self-actualization journey that we, we're on, when we set aside our own life, we're really only able to make sense of the resurrection if we're willing to die. If we're willing to set ourselves aside and follow the call of Christ on the upward journey. It's not until Jesus Christ becomes the center of our roadmap that we really can begin to understand this identity that has been given to us. It's not until we raise our hands up in total self-denial that we begin to actually have a viable roadmap. Remember, we're all trying to come up with our own roadmap. We all are on this journey. The American goal, really, is to have an open road, to choose any way, which way to go. We all want to pick our own roadmap, but it's not until we die to that desire, it's not until we actually lift our hands and say, God, I don't know where I'm going, 
And this road is not leading me anywhere. I feel like I'm spinning my wheels in the mud. It's not until we die to ourselves and our own desires that we're really able to take on the roadmap of Christ. We're really able to take on the gospel, the good news that I don't have to come up with my own roadmap, but that it's actually been given to me. My identity has actually been given to me. I don't have to construct my own world. I don't have to earn my own righteousness, but I'm actually a righteous child in the eyes of God. And when you have that, when you've actually been given the true roadmap that really gives you the life that you're longing for, you don't have to cast off the old restrictions because you get to live towards the goal of Christ. It's not just a life where I'm seeking freedom from restrictions, but I'm actually willing to place the restrictions of Christ on me because it leads me towards the goal. We were listening to a Tim Keller sermon in the car right up, and in it, he says something to the tune of, like, in marriage, you're actually putting on restrictions in love for each other. I don't get to just go out and not tell Ashlyn where I'm going at night. I, I get to live in relationship with her, and that requires that to some level, I'm living under a new life direction. I'm no longer living for myself, but I'm living for the whole. I'm living for us. And something similar happens when we have a relationship with Christ. We no longer get to go any direction we want, but we're actually sent on mission. We're given a direction. We're given an identity. We're given a relationship. And that frees us up to live on mission without having to fear that my righteousness is on the line. Without having to get every nook and cranny right because I'm no longer living for me. I'm living in the freedom of Christ towards the goal, towards the end, which is the upward call of God. So when George Harrison says that any road will do, what he doesn't realize is that he's ultimately condemning you to a life that is far from the will of God. Because any road won't do. We don't get to construct our own life in any direction we want. But actually, when we're willing to die to ourselves and take on the roadmap of Christ, we actually have a new freedom. We have a, a freedom that kind of cuts against the grain of the American sensibility. It's not freedom from, but freedom towards. I'm free to go on mission because I no longer have to construct an identity for myself. Are you with me? Does that make sense? Good. When Jesus is where you're going, you can trust that your identity is not founded on which road you take and how exactly you get there. But you can trust that your identity has been freely given to you. So, first question, what is Paul's roadmap? His roadmap is Christ. His roadmap is the good news. He's dying to himself. He's essentially said, I am no longer living for myself. I'm no longer on this life mission of trying to self-actualize, but I've actually been given an identity. Correct. Paul's roadmap is Christ. It is the good news. That is the foundation on which he's living his life. That is the direction he's aimed. So, for grace in 2021, what is going to be our roadmap? It's fairly obvious. The roadmap is Christ. Now, the next question, how does that roadmap help us to overcome obstacles? How does that roadmap actually help? It's easy to talk about. Yeah, 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 he's Christ. But when things come up that get in our way, we still feel this tendency, I'm trying to live my life for myself. I'm trying to build myself up, and this thing is getting in the way of that. So how does this roadmap actually help us overcome obstacles and actually trust God through the moments, through the difficulties? Let's take a look back at our main passage in Acts 16, or, or at least let's think about it a little deeper. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and read the first three verses again. And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, and having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia, when they had come to Mysia, they attempted to go through to Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus didn't allow them. So instead, they went to Mysia, and they went to Troas. So twice, the Holy Spirit stops them from doing what they felt called to do. The first time, the Holy Spirit stops them from going into Asia. If you were looking at this on a map, they're essentially headed west. They go through Phrygia and Galatia. And Asia's over here, they're trying to go, but then the Holy Spirit stops them. 
And so instead, they want to go up to Mysia. So what that means is if you're looking at it on a map, they go, whoop, and then over to Mysia. And then when they make it to Mysia, they want to go up here to Bithynia. And so they're trying to go up, but the Holy Spirit doesn't let them. And so instead, they keep going west to the Troas. They're really being taken on a journey, if you looked at it on a map. But what you'd actually see as well, if we did a topographical map, and you could kind of see some of the landscape, what's really going on is they start off in Phrygia and Galatia, and this is their first time. They've never made it out this far. And they're going and going, and then there's a big mountain landscape right here. And so what Paul is probably doing is going towards the mountains, and as they get closer, they're realizing, oh gosh, we didn't come prepared to go through the mountains. We only have enough to really make it on this flat ground. We didn't really plan on this giant mountain landscape. And what is the Holy Spirit telling them? He's telling them, don't go through the mountains. You're going to die if you go through the mountains. And so, to them, that really is a roadblock. They planned on going to Asia. They're coming along. This isn't just like they got some prompting, in a sense. They really did have a clear, tangible sign from God, as it were. Don't go through the mountains. You probably won't survive it. Because you're not prepared. And so, we can think in our own lives, if I were on my own mission, and I'm trying to get to Asia, and my identity is on the line, if, if it means the world to me, because I make myself, that I, I need to get to Asia, and I'm coming along and there's mountains in the way, I'm either going to have two responses. My first response is going to say, I'm getting through those mountains, because my identity is on the line. I'm going to do what it takes. So I would pack up my gear and I would start making my way through the mountains and what would happen? I would probably die because I wasn't prepared. But my identity was on line. I had to do it. And it ultimately would lead to my own death. Or, that's one response, or I would feel a sense of shame and guilt because I didn't do it. I didn't make it through the mountains. I failed. And now, in a real sense, my identity is tarnished. I tried to do it and I'm a failure. And I believe that. I begin to believe that because my identity was founded in getting to Asia. But this isn't what happens to Paul. He's actually headed west. He's headed west. He sees the mountains starting to come up on the horizon. And he doesn't waver. He doesn't turn back. He doesn't try to force his way through. He actually goes to God in prayer and says, God, these mountains are in front of me. I can't get through them. Where are you going to lead me next? Because Paul trusts the roadmap, he trusts that ultimately his identity is not found in what he does. He actually believes so deeply in Christ because he trusts the roadmap, he's able to take on the roadblocks with grace. He's able to take on roadblocks not fearing his own loss of identity. He's not ashamed that he didn't make it through the mountains, but he's actually able to return to God and say, God, okay, where next? What's my plan? Where are we headed? I'm with you on this journey. Where are we going next? What's the roadblock that you're feeling in your life right now? Where do you feel like your identity is on the line? If I don't do this, or if I do this, then I will be tarnished then my whole life journey is going to be thrown up in the air. I can tell you some of the things that I'm making idols right now. That if I don't do this, then my journey of self-actualization is going to be thrown away. Then I'll be tarnished. My own identity is going to be ruined. What is that for you? Maybe it's even the call of God. For me right now, I've felt this a lot in the last six months. I haven't been formally working in the, the field that I feel called in, which is church ministry. I haven't been working in it in six months now. And that's been weird for me because it's like I, I feel called in this. I feel like I'm on the direction of this, but I'm working in another industry. And my, I'm, I'm realizing more and more, oh, I'm placing my identity in my good religious works that I do. What is that for you? Where do you feel like if you don't do this, then your identity is going to be tarnished? Maybe it's in your family. You know, maybe we feel like you need to be building the perfect family and doing everything right. And if you don't do this, that, and the other, then your own identity is going to be ruined. 
The Holy Spirit not only blocks Paul, he not only tells Paul, no, wait, but he also gives vision. He also gives direction. Because Paul has the freedom to say no to going into Asia, because the roadblocks are in the way, God also gives the freedom towards Macedonia. In verse 9, a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there urging him, saying, come over to Macedonia, help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God has called us to preach the gospel to them. So, setting sail for Troas, we made voyage for Samarath and Cat. I always pronounce it wrong. Then the following day, the Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is the leading city in the Macedonian Roman colony. And this is important. On the Sabbath day, we went out to the gate, as we suppose it was a place of prayer. We sat down and we spoke to a woman. And this woman named Lydia came from the city of Thyatira. She's a seller of purple goods and a worshiper of God. And the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what Paul was saying. And so they baptized her. They baptized her whole household. And she urged us, saying, if you judge me to be faithful, come and stay in my house. God said no to going into Asia. God said no to going into Bithynia. But he called Paul to go into Macedonia. And frankly, he called him so that God could rescue Lydia. Lydia was a seller of purple goods. What that really means is she's in the marketplace. And she's probably pretty high up in the marketplace. She's really kind of a, a leading figure in the town. And she's a woman. Which, of course, we know in this ancient context is really pretty scandalous of sorts to have a leading woman be a leading figure of the faith. She ends up really kind of ushering in, ushering in the mission of God in her own region because really she's a leader of the community. She's present in the marketplace. She is some of the people engage with frequently and when she becomes a Christian, that matters. Sometimes God does put things in our lives to humble us, and to remind us that we aren't in control, that we're not our journey of self-actualization. But when we then come before God and say, okay, God, I'm weak, I'm smaller than I thought, I return to you, where do you want me? He actually is leading us into his plan, which is truly more miraculous than we can even fathom. He really is leading his church, he's leading his people into some really, really beautiful and wonderful places that are ultimately ushering in the kingdom of God. And he does that through our own death. If we're willing to die to ourselves and trust in the roadmap of God, then we're able to take on roadblocks gracefully and actually trust that they lead us to a place, a place of beauty, a place where the kingdom is really flourishing, and it all begins with our own death, which is so counterintuitive. It's so countercultural. And we're actually coming out of the Christmas season. Uh, I love the renewal passage we read this morning. I think it's really another example of this. Or um, they go into Egypt. You know, like, like we had said earlier, Egypt in the Israelite mind is the place of captivity. It's where we were slaves. Why would we return there? That is, a, that is a wicked and evil place. It is a place where we didn't have freedom from. You know, the American sensibility is such that returning to a place of restriction? Oh gosh. Like we are, we're people who seek after freedom from but God is actually calling Mary and Joseph to return to the place of restriction. Now, I, I'm not entirely trying to make this a COVID-related thing, but it is something to think about. What, how would we respond if we were called back into a place of restriction? How would we respond if we were essentially sent back to Egypt? Would we trust God? Or would we rebel and say, no, my identity is found in not being under Egypt's rule? Or would we trust God? 
He ultimately calls them there. He puts this roadblock, as it were, in their life. They actually have to trust God and go through this. And he does this so that it can be fulfilled that the Son of God would come from Egypt. These roadblocks, these things that get put in our way, that may seem like they're totally opposite of the kingdom, that may seem like they're placing more and more restrictions on us, that may seem like we're actually going into darkness, God can use and weave to lead us to be free to trust God, to be free to believe in His mercy and in His grace. Do we believe that? Or do we just seek freedom from? Do we feel the sense of freedom to trust God in the midst of of struggle. Uh, I think it was the worst time for Mary to have given birth. She was alone, riding on a donkey. Imagine being pregnant for nine months, and it's the night of, and you're riding on a donkey. Ashlyn was in the car probably about two months ago. We were driving here, and she had some stomach pain, and she was hurting, and it's like, we're stuck in the car for two hours, and she's dying over here. Imagine being on a donkey pregnant. Nine months in, how painful it would be. It was the worst time to have a worst time to have a child. The biggest roadblocks ever were put in her way, but because they trusted God, because they went into Egypt, they were able to draw the sun out and fulfill the promises of God. Because Mary had a greater roadmap, she was able to take on the roadblocks, and as Luke says, she was able to treasure all things. Even the roadblocks, even the obstacles in her life, because she had a roadmap that was leading her on a, on a narrative of grace and on a narrative of mercy. We have friends, uh, their names are Dale and Amy. They're in their late 20s. They, a couple of years ago, had really planned on mission work. They planned on moving to London and uh, sort of setting up their life, as it were, as missionaries on the field. But you know, just a couple months before they're getting ready to go into training, they find out she's pregnant. This is really, really unexpected. And, and so they're, they're trying to reorient their life. They're trying to figure out, how do I do these things? Now I'm going to be a mother. I'm probably going to stay here. And so they, they eventually shifted their journey. And that was a really hard transition for them, but a really beautiful one. They're really excited about it. They're getting ready to move into this new season of parenthood. And unfortunately, just a couple weeks in that, they found out that they had a miscarriage. And so it, it shattered them. It was one of the most difficult seasons probably of their whole life where they're being thrown through the tidal waves of life. It's like, God, we thought we were going here. And then you changed our perspective and we got really excited about this. And now, God, you're taking this away too. Where are we going? And so... These are people who have really, really faced the roadblocks of life. I'm sure you have stories like this, where you thought that you were headed one direction, and God seemed to take that away, but then you kind of headed in another one, and then he seemed to take that away too. Roadblocks kept appearing. You thought you were going to Asia, and he took that away, and you thought you were going to Bithynia, and he took that away. And you wonder, God, where, where are you? Where am I headed? Thankfully, Dale and Amy have continued to have the roadmap of Christ. They've continued to trust that God is actually drawing them into drawing them into his mission. They sense of really settled roots in Austin, Texas, and we were just with them. They're living a beautiful life. And God has really, really set them there to do work. And He's he, He's essentially drawing out of them. Things that they couldn't even imagine. Things that they didn't even plan on being in Austin. Because they were willing and able to take the roadblocks with the grace of Christ. And because they surrendered even the painful things to God. They were able to really, really begin to see some of the fruits of following the roadmap of Christ. So, let's wrap this up. Uh, of course, we can all extrapolate a sort of roadmap and roadblock for us today. But like I said earlier, Grace Lincoln is getting ready to enter into its second year, maybe maybe even second and a half year of corporate worship. This is its year entering to 2021. 
And so, I want us to think, as a church, okay, 2020 had its own set of roadblocks that we were dealing with. What are those roadblocks? Were they painful for us? Were they easy for us? Did we find our identity in where we were headed before the roadblock? How are you dealing with that roadblock today? And 2021 is just on the horizon. We can see the mountains starting to maybe bubble up. Maybe we can see a few roadblocks that are coming. You may be feeling like Mary, that it's the worst time to have a baby. Maybe it's the worst time to plant a church. Maybe you're discouraged or maybe you're encouraged. You know, we, we're talking to this guy named Rem and we're, we're starting to get really excited. Maybe this is actually going to work. Maybe we're going to be able to do the, this, that, and the other. How are we going to make sure that we're trusting in the roadmap of Christ and not in the roadmap of our own self-actualization? How are we going to make sure that we're not just trusting that if we have a big and healthy, successful church, then we are following Christ? But what if it were actually more nuanced than that? What if we were prepared even to take the roadblocks with grace and joy? Now, I'm not saying that there will be, but are we prepared? Do we, have a, do we have a conceptualization of that? Are we ready to go on the road that Christ is calling us on? I want to ask again, where are you going? What is your roadmap this year? Like Paul, does your roadmap begin with dying to yourself? With dying to your own conception of what your own life needs to look like or what your church needs to look like? Does it begin with a dying to yourself? and an assurance in the identity that Christ has given to you and that Christ has given to your community? How can you rely on that identity to get past these roadblocks? Not yourself, not your own strength, not your own ability, but rely on the identity that Christ has given you to move past the roadblocks. And if you, maybe you're feeling some roadblocks right now in your own life, if you are, what does it look like to return to God in prayer and say, okay, God, you are putting this roadblock in front of me. Where do you have me next? What's the next direction? God, where do you have our church? How can you help us and teach us to die to ourselves for the sake of the kingdom? Amen. And may God bless with the preaching of his word. Let's see. Let me pray real quick. And then we'll move on to the offering. Father in heaven, teach us to die to ourselves. Teach us to trust in you and, and to ultimately rely on you as our roadmap. God, we believe that we run from you too often, that we think that any road will do. But we do that because we, we think that we are the end goal. We think that if I just did this, if I just had that, then we'd be there. But God, teach us that the road is, is ultimately leading towards you. That we're not in this for ourselves, but that we're in this ultimately because you've called us, because you've given us the identity that we craved. So teach us to trust in that, Father. And God, we pray for our church that you would continue to teach us not to build up our own understandings of what a healthy church needs to look like, but that you'd ultimately be leading us to trust in the identity that you've already given us. And that that would help us to weather any storm. And would ultimately give us the freedom to move into mission. And give us the freedom to go towards the community. Not freedom to be away from restrictions, but freedom to place the right restrictions on us. Freedom to guide us on our path. Freedom to ultimately die to ourselves and strain towards the goal of Christ. We pray this in the name of the Father, and Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
this week is Psalm 105, 1. Give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known among the nations what he has done. And there are envelopes in the back if you feel called to give to the church in any way. You can also give your time uh, any way that you can. So if you want to help in some way, you can always reach out um, or you can give financially. So if you would rise as we sing our last song.